please help me in welcoming Varsha and her talk, A Letter to the High Achieving Woo! Teenagers. So as a kid, I grew up in Florida first, and I was always very curious. That's a photo of me about the age of one. I grabbed my dad's camera bag, and I assumed it was a hat, and I was trying to put it on my head. Try things very differently, out of the box. I was also very imaginative. I think part of that had to do with the fact that I grew up in Florida. I mean, I was 45 minutes away from Disney World. All the imagination, the world of imagination was right there. And that was me with a little koala bear, and I would pretend that this koala was alive, and I could speak to the koala. I was also very creative. I loved arts and crafts. I loved just putting things together to make things new, different. And this continued through my childhood. At the age of six, I ended up moving to Canada, to the Niagara region, where I still live today. And I was enjoying all these activities, but I could never really find one thing that sort of piqued my interest, that sort of took all my different characteristics and allowed me to be me. But that changed when I entered the world of science fairs. <laughs> Guess I haven't entered the world of science fairs yet. Well, I started science fairs at the age of 12. It was in middle school, and my dad told me that the local science fair was coming up. And I was like, okay, maybe I'll do the science fair. And then I did a basic project. It was basically what I did was I took some plants, put them underneath some cars, and tried to see if car exhaust from different cars would kill plants. They basically killed all the plants. <laughs> I also did more projects onwards about different things in environmental sciences. Trying to see how to make fruits last longer in our fridge, trying to see if we can use plants to accumulate heavy metals. And so I did these projects at the regional and national level, a few science fairs here and there. But I'd like to say I hit my science fair jackpot when I encountered this vegetable right here. This vegetable is called mango ginger. And on the outside, it looks like a ginger, and on the inside, it kind of tastes and smells a little bit like a mango. It's commonly found in South India, which is where I went to visit my grandfather back in 2011. And he cut this off, and he put it in everything we eat as a garnish. And I'm not a fan of traditional ginger, so I was kind of like, Grandpa, why are you doing this? Like, please don't. <laughs> and he's like, oh no, see, I'm 88 and I'm healthy. It's because I eat this every day. You should do it too. You'll be healthy. Traditional grandfather advice, and I'm like, yeah, sure, whatever. I ate it, moved on with my life. But then I was on the flight back from India, and I was talking to my dad, who's a scientist. And he's like, he, your grandpa's kind of right. Like, there's some historical evidence to it. I'm like, historical evidence, yes. But I was someone who really cared about the facts. I wanted the science behind it. So I'm like, scientifically, is there anything to prove this? We look, there's not really much. There was like one paper somebody published from India, maybe in like 2001. So I was like, okay, I want to go more into this. I want to see what's in mango ginger that makes it so good. So I decided to go the route of antibiotics. I wanted to see whether this had antibiotic properties, whether it could kill bacteria. It turns out it did. This vegetable right here contained a few compounds that are antibiotic. And not only do they kill bacteria, they kill bacteria that are traditionally resistant to antibiotics. So essentially, I found a new antibiotic. And so mango ginger took me on some of the biggest journeys of my life. I applied for my first patent at the age of 15. So here I was, filing for a patent, yet I couldn't go get what you want. <laughs> Next, I won a gold medal at the Canada White Science Fair when I was 16. So this put me in the top level of science students in Canada. And this was a really cool experience. I got to present my project at the national level and get recognized for it at a national level. And so moving on from nationals, the next logical step would be going internationally. I got to place fourth at the International Science Fair in the microbiology category as a part of Team Canada. Now Team Canada at Science Fair is about seven to 12 people per year. So I got to be part of this small team of Team Canada and represent the country at the international level. It's kind of like the Olympics of Science Fair. Like, I'm not really the greatest athlete, so this is like my claim. Hey, look, I went internationally. I also got to present my research at a conference at Harvard University. So I got to go to the big leagues and present my research, which is a really cool experience. I got to talk to academics, other researchers, and get to sort of get some feedback about my research. 
And then the biggest thing that this project took me was to McLean's Magazine. I was named one of Canada's future leaders under the age of 25 in a special issue of McLean's Magazine in 2014, back when I was in 12th grade. So this was another really cool experience because it sort of took what I've done and put it to sort of national attention. And I started to get a lot of feedback and a lot of comments, a lot of students looking up to me. It's like, how did you do what you do? Um, how did you get here? What, what's your story? And I was like, okay, people are actually interested in what I do. I was just kind of wanting to do science experiments. And so science fair was a big experience of my life. And suddenly, I grade 12, I did all these activities. I did seven years of science fair, 25 different science fairs, countless awards, trips, you name it. But it was kind of over all of a sudden. And so I had this moment where I was like, now, now what do I do? And so I was an undergrad and I got to reflect on this experience. And what a lot of people like to ask me was, did science fair impact your future? I'll get back to this question again at the end, but the short answer is yes. And so the biggest thing that science fair gave me is communication skills. If you talked to me when I was 11 or 12, I really didn't like to talk to people. My mom would be like at her temple, she'd be like, hey, you should go up and talk about this, and I'll be like, e no. <laughs> and even my first science fair, I talked to the judge that judged me there. He's still a judge at science fair, it's been 10 years now. He's like, remember when I judged you and I had to like pay you to talk almost? He's like, that was a good time because now you can't shut up. <laughs> and so it's given me the ability to speak, have this confidence to speak to an audience. It's also given me the ability to do presentations with preparation, without preparation. Sometimes I'll get people asking me, hey, can you talk about this and just give me a small little tidbit and I can almost improv it. So it's given me that ability. It's given me the ability to look at learning in the inquiry-based model. Now, traditionally at school, the way you learn is you kind of get that content presented to you. Let's take physics. You get kinematics presented to you. So you learn the formulas, you learn to memorize the formulas, apply the formulas, learning the size of the audience. I'm gonna guess a lot of you are taking physics right now. <laughs> yeah, and it's, sometimes it's just repetitive, it's boring, and you just gotta have to do the work. But with inquiry, it's you ask the questions, answer these questions and pick up that knowledge while you're answering it. It's sort of applying what you're learning to real life situations. So I got to practice this in high school and this is kind of the way learning is going at the undergrad level, the graduate level, and even at the workforce level. A lot of it of trying to develop solutions to problems is by answering questions. I also got to get the biggest network and the coolest network I like to think about it. Um, I got to meet so many cool people through science fair from across the country and we're still friends to this day. I went to my first national science fair in 2010. That was almost 10 years ago and I still talk to a lot of those people. I went to the international science fair in 2014. We started a Facebook group chat right after we came back. That group chat is still active. We talk about things like just what we're doing in life. Sometimes it's research related. Some of us are in undergrad, grad school. We're trying to figure out different things about our own projects. We're in different fields. We chat about things like that. And I can walk into a lot of different events and meet a science fair person like that, even right now. Out of curiosity, is anybody here a science fair kid? Anybody has done a science fair? See one person there, a few of you. Science fair creates this large network and almost everybody can relate to each other through these science fair experiences. And so it's also left me in this unique position it's allowed me to sort of think about what I've done and be able to speak to you about my experience and sort of motivate you, inspire you, sort of give you a few lessons of what I've learned through my experiences in science fair and how you can apply that, whether you want to pursue science or academic research, whether you want to start a charity, you want to build something new, you want to write a book, anything like that. What I like to talk to you about is how to be the best highly motivated teenager you can be. And I like to say high achieving, high motivated as teenagers who sort of, you have the standard. People, society thinks of teenagers as being able to do some things. A lot of people set the bar really low for teenagers. They think you're the generation that watches TikToks, Tide Pods, all that stuff. <laughs> and they, or they maybe think that you're the group that'll just say okay boomer to everything and I don't say. <laughs> 
But I think that teenagers are a lot more than that. You guys are high achieving. A lot of you want to aim higher than that. You want to make a difference. How many of you can classify yourself as a highly motivated or high achieving teenager? And that's most of the audience. So I want to give you a little bit of lessons to what you can do. The first thing I'd like to say is be curious. And by be curious, I want you to ask questions and find these answers. And don't be afraid to ask these questions. So what I like to think about is, is that there's no such thing as a dumb question or a dumb comment, dumb answer. Even if you're just at the beginning, like, oh, I'm curious about scientific research, but what is scientific research? It's OK to ask, what is scientific research? That's not a dumb question. Or how do I start a charity? Where do I go to write a book? It's OK to ask any of those questions. And the answers are out there for you. There are people you can contact. Social media is great. Now you can find people like myself or other people who have done these activities ahead of you. And they've done what you want to do. And you can ask them questions. You can contact people on social media. Google exists. The library still exists. <laughs> Another thing is being committed. So anything being high achieving is a process. It takes time. It's not something that happened overnight. I made it on McLean's Magazine, but that was after seven years of science fair. It wasn't after just one sudden day I made it on McLean's Magazine. It was after a lot of work. And so I like to bring up this quote that my undergrad professor liked to say. Science is a process. And this is from Dr. Chad Harvey at McMaster University, one of my favorite professors. Science is a process, the way I like to look at it, is it's not quick, it's not one step. It's a lot of work, a lot of back and forth, a lot of trial and error. And that's the same thing for anything you want to achieve. It's a lot of trial and error, trying to fit the pieces, what seems right, what works. So it's a process, and you've got to be committed to that process. Be collaborative. So a lot of my science fair work, even though I was the one presenting, it was a team effort. There were about I'd say 10 mentors behind my work, helping me with different aspects. Some in microbiology, some in chemistry, some with printing my poster, presenting my research. So there's a lot of different people behind it. And so if you want to do something big, something beyond your comfort zone, find that team. Find that group of people that will help you and collaborate with them. Don't try to do it on your own. Age is just a number. A lot of you are young here, a lot of people say 13, 14, 15, 16. And a lot of people don't believe that kids can do things like that, big things. But I'd like to believe that age is just a number, and you can get that experience no matter how young you are. Most of my science fair research happened when I was between 14 and 17 years old. Like I said, I applied for a patent before I could get my G1. So a lot of things you can do, you don't let that age limit you. Aim for experience. So this is, a lot of people come to me when I say, oh, I've done a lot in science fair. And they're like, so what did you win? And I'll be like, yeah, so I won this, won that. And people will be like, so how do I win the science fair? But if you're here to win the science fair, you shouldn't be doing science fair at all. You should be there to do science fair for the sake of science, for the sake of research, for the sake of learning. You shouldn't be there to aim for an award, a prize, getting into the coolest university program. That shouldn't be your motivation to do amazing things. It should be to sort of something bigger, to help society, to help yourself, like help yourself grow as a person. And so the, this is relating to what I like to say, set the right goals. And that goal should be you. You should look at how to make yourself better, how to improve yourself, how to get better skills, just to be the best you you can be. And so the question people ask me now is, what am I doing now? I talked to you about my science fair experience. I talked to you about my teenage years. What am I doing now? Well, I finished my undergrad at McMaster University. And through my undergrad, I got involved in science fairs again, but in a different way. I got to be a judge at the regional and national level. I got to pick the teams that represented Canada internationally. And then I also got to mentor students in science fair. I got to sort of teach them my ways and how I did things and sort of get their projects to the next level. And I get to do things like this. Speak to audiences of youth and motivate them, inspire them, and advocate for them. 
to say, look, science is an option, being highly high achieving, being highly motivated is an option, it should be allowed, it should be promoted. And now I'm in graduate school and I'm pursuing research even more at a different level. So going back to that question, did science fair impact my future? My graduate school research is on mango ginger. My science fair research was on mango ginger. So did science fair impact my future? I could say so. Thank you.